Hello everyone and welcome to our show. Today we discuss more about AI tools, how you can get high results to create high quality content with AI tools. I know that many people are skeptical that it's impossible today, probably in the future, but not today. So I'm excited to discuss this topic with Leonard. How are you? Hi, Anatoly. I'm good. I'm good. Happy to dive in. Yeah, it's a big pleasure to get you on my show to learn more about AI because the last time I started to pay more attention with that. Before we start, just tell more about your experience, background, and why you decided to pay attention with AI. Oh, great. So, uh, so uh, my own background, I had a, initially studied a, a computer science and biology because I was uh, a very much uh, curious about the potential of analytics to really change the scientific sphere. I uh, wound up moving out to San Francisco to pursue my graduate degree in uh, the subject. Uh, and I quickly realized that in the Bay Area, it's not always easy for a poor grad student to uh, pay the rent. So I started my own uh, analytics and data science consultancy on the, on the side, just of an extra stream of income. And this basically entailed me cold emailing local startups and saying, hey, do you have any data that needs analyzed? And uh, in this uh, manner, I was able to establish certain connections in the entrepreneurial community and got very much interested in natural language processing. Because if you can uh, analyze the characters making up a uh, strand of DNA, you can make analyze the characters making up a sentence or a paragraph. In fact, it's probably much easier to do so because then you can read the actual text and realize, you know, confirm that your prediction is correct as opposed to spending mm -hmm. six months in the lab. Eventually, I was asked to join uh, uh, the founding team of a startup called Primer, which uh, applied uh, machine learning to text analytics and natural language processing. And I was in charge of building out Primer's uh, foundational algorithms. I helped uh, grow that team from four people to nearly 100 people. But after a while, I began to uh, miss my roots in uh, the healthcare space. So I wound up transitioning uh, out and joining uh, uh, joining a small startup called uh, Anomaly, which uh, did a lot more in the, in healthcare and uh, particularly looking for examining healthcare fraud and trying to fix broken healthcare payments. And I'm uh, um, currently head of a uh, data science uh, and machine learning uh, at Anomaly. I uh, uh, have a book out, Data Science Bookcamp, where I talk about data science and AI and machine learning uh, techniques. And again, very much fascinated with the subject um, and the technology and its potential impact on our, our futures. Mm, awesome. Awesome. I, I like your story, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to ask the first question about uh, possibilities of AI today. What do you think? Uh, for example, can AI replace you and me, you know, to provide this broadcast, you know, to share some interesting stuff or... Uh, I don't know because for example uh, let me explain why i'm asking yeah. about that uh, i found on youtube uh yeah. youtube channel open ai and uh, all videos are filmed by ai you no know, yes. uh, sound uh, all videos uh i found an article uh, that was published in huffington post and written by ai what do yes. you think uh what ai can do today because uh many people are skeptical i understand why uh, the, because AI tools always create some crap, you know, not good content, yes, uh, yes. not high quality. How yes. to fix it and how it's possible to create high quality content with AI tools? Yes. So the way I see it, uh, AI can unfortunately replace us, but not today. today. Not today. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm also a, a, a bit of a, 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 you know, a history. They're of, busy on Friday. <laughs> Yes, no, no, and that, this this is my, my my favorite my favorite way of looking at it. Let's say through the the prism of uh, history was uh, you know back in the 1800s you had the the, Nepal, the, the Napoleonic Wars, and uh, mm -hmm. kind of one of one of the most powerful technological tools at the time was uh, artillery. You could not win a battle without artillery. At the same time, mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't uh, you know just having artillery wasn't enough. You needed uh, cavalry you needed people charging on horses which is what people have uh, done for uh thousands of years now 100 years later in world war one uh artillery eventually took over and you couldn't ride a horse into battle anymore 
but it took a hundred years. And this is, uh, this is my current views on AI and machine learning. It's uh, incredibly powerful technology. It is heavy, kind of, uh, you know, uh, cumbersome, uh, difficult to deploy and use without certain level of expertise. And not only do you need a human element, but you need to use AI in conjunction with uh, metaphorical uh, cavalry, aka uh, ideas and techniques that's been around for a hundred of years, hundreds of years. So at this point, AI is uh, a tool that we uh, as content creators uh, need to be able to uh, leverage to explore and create new content more efficiently, but without us, uh, the tools will flounder. Now, a hundred years from now, anything is possible. <laughs> yeah, you know, you remind me of one movie uh, when uh, someone uh, created one of the first uh, cars and mm -hmm. uh, that was broken. And yeah. uh, when neighbor uh, walked around and told him, uh, buy a horse, what are you doing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and yeah. it's the same with uh, AI tools when you are trying to create high quality text with AI, okay. but it's not good, you know, and someone can yeah. tell you, uh, write manually, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And uh, I want to ask about uh, possibilities that AI yes. can do today. Can you tell? Uh, uh, I mean, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, I'm using AI to uh, create structure of my content yes. because for, uh, if I do this job manually, I need to open HRF, SEMrush or any other yes. recognizable tools, find a list of keywords to check out user intent, go to Google, uh, spend some time, and then I can structure content uh, by using all these keywords. But with AI tools, I can do it for a minute. Really, yes. it, it's, uh, it helps to save so much time. But when I create content, I'm not satisfied uh, in, in most cases. That's mm -hmm. uh, true because, yeah, uh, sometimes it's rewriting, not good quality. I can't get a new valuable size. Can you tell uh, what AI can do today better than a human or, for example, to save time and uh, when they are not ready, you know, to replace human? Okay. Okay. So this is my, the other way I... Uh... I like to look at uh, AI. Right now, machine learning uh, it can do everything that, uh, that, let's say, not everything, but a lot of machine what machine learning and AI can do right now is on the level of what a uh, kind of a lazy 16 year, year old teenager uh, can mm -hmm. do. So it can, uh, you know, drive a car, but not necessarily very well. You wouldn't. Uh, uh, necessarily trusted to drive a truck across all the United States, and you wouldn't uh, trust it to do a uh, complicated surgery. You can have it write a short story or an essay, but again, on uh, on the level of what a 16-year-old would write with uh, minimal effort. And so, mm -hmm. uh, kind of the, I guess uh, the the main benefits of AI right now is it necessarily a quality, but mm -hmm. it. Uh, it's scale. If you could have an army of uh, sixteen-year-olds doing a bunch of uh, menial tasks, but at scale and not having to worry about child labor laws, uh, then uh, you can be incredibly uh, kind of uh, let's say uh, empowered. Like for instance, mm -hmm. uh, if you watch, uh, if you've seen some of the latest tools come out of uh, OpenAI, they are uh, you know amazing. They they are like magic. There's, uh, for instance, a model called uh, Clip that allows you to classify uh, any image across basically any axes of uh, of description uh, to to a level of detail that's just immense and overwhelming. What are the use cases for that? Well, you can imagine right now, you know, sadly, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, with uh, uh, with uh, let's say. Uh, uh, you know the the shootings that's been go that that have been going going on in the United States. There's mm -hmm. uh, efforts to kind of monitor social media and find uh, kind of uh, individuals that are at uh, moderate risk for violence and uh, just be aware of them. It's not a task that uh, you know any team of humans can do by hand, but you can use the clip model to basically specify a set of uh, key phrases. Find, uh, for instance, uh, you know, find pictures that have individuals with uh, rifles or guns, 
that look young and are not dressed in hunting gear. So you want to filter out anyone who's in the woods hunting because that's normal. But if you have like a teenager posing aggressively with a gun, you want to at least be able to flag and uh, and report that. And you can describe uh, basically that signal in a few, you know, using a few few keywords. Again, this is all something that any individual can do, but not at scale. And so it's the scale that's uh, uh, kind of, you know, very much impressive. And in regards to, again, in regards to more, you know, writing and text generation, I'm fascinated by the work coming out, you know, coming out from these uh, text generation generation uh, uh, models and modules. I think there's still that missing piece of allowing an author to be more creative and provide a kind of like more feedback to ensure that the model tells the type of story that or like the type of narrative that the author is uh, looking for. But you can imagine uh, the AI model is serving as like, you know, uh, a, an author's young assistant that basically says, hey, have you considered, you know, using this colorful phrasing or taking the story uh, you know, in 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 this direction, there was a Japanese director who uh, wound up directing a movie that was partially written by his eight year old daughter, and it was a very unusual and creative movie. Well, like you know, the AI AI can do that. So, uh, and again, I'm I personally I'm blown away. Ten years ago, would have never expected for us to have uh, technology at this capacity, but uh, we still have a lot more effort to do until uh, you know the AI grows from 16, year, 16 years old to 30. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. I found on your LinkedIn that you, uh, that I found on LinkedIn, that you have experience from 2014, you know, with AI. Yes. Can you tell yeah. how it's evolving for this time? It's like uh, seven years. Uh, uh, I remember two years ago, that was hard to find a good AI tools. Today, I have a bunch of them, a lot of yeah. AI tools. Yeah. And yeah, uh, this industry is very competitive. Can you tell how it's evolving uh, and what kind of future can you predict with AI? Yeah, yeah. so again, so... Uh, by the way, the, the evolution of, uh, of AI is uh, partially driven, uh, well, it's driven by a whole, no a whole range of factors. But remember, people were excited about the AI since the 1950s and then the 1970s. Why are, mm -hmm. why are we seeing what we're seeing right now? Well, first of all, uh, kind of, a, you know, computers have gotten faster. Neural networks have been around forever, but they were, it was never really realistic to use them at this uh, sort of scale that we're using uh, them now. Uh, more importantly, uh, private companies are putting in uh, money, a lot of money. One of these like uh, massive model models can, uh, uh, you know, take uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to, <laughs> to train in a, in a, in a single go. So it's in, incredibly it's incredibly expensive it's beyond the range of what let's say an academic research lab uh, could do so even though these models are being developed by academics they're being uh, financed by kind of corporations like uh, google and facebook and open ai open ai and here's the amazing part uh these corporations are releasing many of these models uh out into the open for us to uh to freely use which again is is rare in uh in in the business world so this combination of uh, this influx of just uh technology that's finally gotten to the right level of speed uh the the graphics cards developed for video games like 20 years ago again this is powered by technology that was never really intended to build uh you know automated intelligences it was just uh, it was developed so when you play call of duty uh, the frame rate is faster. It just so happens that the same set of linear algebra operations that can make video games look more beautiful can also more efficiently compute neural networks. It's a happy, uh, happy coincidence. And again, influx of uh, kind of, uh, yeah, it, the influx of money from the corporations is, is really interesting. Now, here's what's fascinating. Uh, so the corporations, let's say OpenAI, Google, they're releasing these massive models that are maybe too computationally massive for us to, uh, for, for, for someone like me to like run on my laptop. But then what we can do is we can take those models and then like we can like, you know, squeeze them out and make smaller models. So, um, you know, maybe I don't need a model that can uh, uh, classify an image across 10 million different categories. I just need a model to be able to, uh, I don't know, like uh, 
uh, detect the uh, detect the type of car or, or you know out on the street because I'm interested in, I don't know, automating a valet service or something of that sort. And so I can take their model and I can, uh, you know, feed my own data into it and I can make it smaller and more nibbler and more appropriate for my uh, individual uh individual use case. So I'm not, once I do that, I'm no longer dependent on Google. I'm no longer dependent on open AI. I used, had my model learn from their model in a way, their model is the teacher. My model is the student. It learns and it's not as effective as the teacher, but it can do what I want it to do. And I benefit from that. And then my business can benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love your answer. You know, yeah, we'll explain. Can you tell more about uh, using AI for uh, SMB, uh, small, medium businesses? Because, you know, uh, we can see Amazon yeah. is investing a lot. Facebook is investing yes. a lot. Google, uh, yeah, I think billion dollars, you know, invested in AI. Uh, and yeah, uh, but, you know, when I uh, check out a few replies from John Mueller, he replied, yeah don't use AI because it's crap. You can create high quality content, but Google uh, uses AI uh, in their algorithm to create content, anything. Can you tell, uh, can uh, SMB use AI today? Is it possible or uh, it's only for big companies? No, yes. So uh, if small businesses can definitely use AI, but as always, it comes with uh, a caveat. So mm -hmm. uh, depends on the business and depends on the use case. And this is where it gets uh, where it gets very critical to know whether or not your use case is uh, appropriate. So uh, anything, uh, any any business that requires processing of uh, of, of of images and text can uh, can use AI. Mm -hmm. In fact, many of these businesses. Uh, already do uh you know a, a lot of small businesses for instance use automated systems to kind of uh you know take photographs of receipts process them to fill out spreadsheets automatically honestly there's so many ai uh, to kind of uh to be able to you know you can sign a check photograph it it gets uploaded to that your account a lot of the uh, small businesses use ai's uh, uh ubiquitously uh this is where mm -hmm. the real issue comes in and this is uh, where, you know, both small businesses and us as a kind of, you know, uh, uh, individuals interested in AI and trying to leverage, uh, you know, interested in the really powerful AI coming out of Google and trying to leverage uh, those tools, we need to be cautious. Uh, there's an area where Google's models are bad and where uh, open AI models are, are bad and where they're not going to necessarily work on their business use case. And that is where mm -hmm. data is uh, is heterogeneous. What I mean by heterogeneous, that's where you have an Excel sheet with a whole bunch of different uh, tabs. Like suppose, I don't know, you have a small business that's like monitoring Airbnb rentals and you have a bunch of very uh, incongruous information like address of property, how many, you know, how many rooms, I don't know, like does it have a bathroom or not, uh, local property taxes. So each spreadsheet column is very different from the column next to it. Tabular data, as it's called in the business. And when it comes to tabular data, neural networks, they're just not, you know, they're not that great. Neural networks like everything, uh, you know, prefer that everything is, uh, they, they like large, similar data sets, like the ocean. The ocean is huge and everything is, uh, you know, it is water. When things uh, become, when data sets are smaller and more diverse, well, these models are going to uh, struggle. Fortunately, there's a very excellent model called XGBoost that does great with uh, uh, with tabular data, but XGBoost is fickle. It's hard to train. You really have to think about the features, feature engineering. And while a bunch of businesses can benefit from XGBoost models, they, they would need somebody to kind of train those models by hand, and that would uh, eliminate uh uh, kind of like eliminate their their like immediate use case. Not every small business can hire a data scientist, and not every small business uh, should. Uh, having having said that, uh, again, uh, you know, kind of a, a text uh, imaging uh, scheduling uh, problems common to uh, you know, basically, you know, we we all have senses. Uh, we have eyes, we have, you know, we, we, we have ears, we read, we hear, we, you know, we speak. 
Uh, and that is something that uh, kind of like any employee of a business would do. So kind of like, you know, small bits of automation, automating, I don't know, telephone calls, automating the processing of receipts, uh, you know, hiring, well, hiring a bunch of uh, 16 year old assistants without violating labor laws. That's what AI provides you. And so you can use it to make your business maybe like, uh, you know, a small business five to 10 to 15 percent more uh you know more efficient but you have to be smart about how to use the, you use and deploy these tools at this point mm -hmm. love it love it uh i have the question about uh your company anomaly okay. can you tell what kind of advantages you have uh, uh how it can help uh, businesses to save money or time okay. or uh, other resources yeah. And why uh, some companies need to consider uh, anomaly, you know, uh, yeah, to, to take your services? Okay. So, uh, so again, for, for, for context. So, anomaly uh, in particular is uh, kind of uh, focused on, uh, on, on a healthcare billing. And this is something mm -hmm. that affects us as patients, but it also uh, affects uh, large numbers of uh, kind of, uh, you know, businesses um big and small and let me basically let me ex explain why and explain why mm -hmm. so first of all we all know that uh healthcare payments sadly in the united states are very much broken it's like two to ten percent of all healthcare claims have some sort of an appropriate billing on them like leading mm -hmm. to uh hundreds of billions dollars worth you know uh you know worth of inappropriate payments every year like imagine getting your credit card statement and it's wrong 10 percent of the time you won't put up with it but that's the state of the art in uh healthcare today. How does that affect companies big and small? Well, there are many organizations out there that are directly responsible for uh, the health insurance of their employees. Uh, it can be a perk working at an organization that guarantees, you know, a certain level of health insurance uh, at a certain cost, which is, again, which is nice to have. But at the same time, those organizations are partially on the hook for paying the healthcare costs of uh, Kind of uh you know their employees so if you have uh you know if you have employees going to a local hospital system where either due to error or you know some malfeasance for whatever reason there's a kind of a you know a systematic miscommunication and systematic or you know like uh erroneous healthcare billing well then that's gonna that's gonna drain your you know your business and again this is an example of the type of problem where Kind of a smart automation can really help uh you know uh, flag these uh, uh the the these errors at low cost because the alternative is to uh you know outsource the review of let's say if you're in a co corporation with tens of thousands of employees your alternative is to you know uh you know out basically outsource the review of all of those claims to uh to a country where you can cheaply pay you know, like you know, you know, thousands of people to look through those claims manually. And even then it's not a very efficient process. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, can you tell, uh, for example, if someone uh, takes uh, your services, uh, 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 I, I want to ask, you know, uh, about uh, some occupations, I yes. mean, like accounting or others, yes. they're in dangerous because AI can replace them. Uh, or because I understand it helps businesses to save money. What about people? Uh, can yes. AI replace them? And uh, I remember when Uber uh, was created, yep. uh, a million accountant, yeah, a million people lost their jobs because yep. they uh, connected uh, drivers and uh, clients. What about yes. uh, other occupations? What do you think AI can make dangerous uh, for some occupations or not? No, look, uh, so uh, uh, the, the, this uh, this was so yeah, yes, it can, and uh, and uh, that has been the case for uh, for the last uh, the you know uh, like the the last seventy years, uh, kind of uh, the kind of uh, the 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 researcher who developed kind of a uh, uh, the the line of thinking which eventually r led to modern AI, kind of uh, Norbert Wiener, the creator of cybernetics, uh, in uh, 1950s wrote uh, his book uh, Human Use of Human Beings, warning uh, 1950s society that kind of automation was coming. 
years before we we saw kind of neural networks and uh, machine learning models uh you had uh, the use of algorithmic uh, kind of a scheduling that would uh kind of schedule resource pipelines in an automated optimal manner uh replacing the jobs of individuals whose role it was to actually kind of uh, you know schedule these pipelines and this is not machine learning this is kind of you know simple operations research uh, uh mathematics applied to a field that was uh you know once carried out by uh you know a human uh the mm -hmm. counter argument has always been uh that 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 these tools also they take jobs uh but uh they also uh provide new employment opportunities i don't necessarily agree with that argument yes it's possible but at the same time, it's possible that you can like completely, you know, automate a certain uh, field of work out of existence. And I think governments should be cognizant of that and, uh, you know, provide ways for people to re-educate themselves or to seek uh, new work opportunities. I do think there's an area that, that I, I do think, uh, personally speaking, and I might be wrong here, I, I have my doubts whether uh the machines will ever get to the point where where they can uh suppress uh you know human creativity and by creativity i mean the capacity to kind of uh, imagine and create something uh something new that is beyond beyond our shared cultural history so yes uh, a computer can generate kind of an art painting in the style of, in the style of van gogh or picasso you can tell it mix five different artists together and create a painting and it will do that but I do think that there's a certain kind of human spark that is uh, required to just, you know, to have organizations and companies be successful and to move uh, move society uh, forward. But, you know, at the same time, you should be should be careful, not just AI technology can, uh, yeah. can dispel more more jobs that it than it creates. And uh, it's it's been and it's been that way for. Uh, for for 50 years kurt vonnegut in 1951 he wrote a book called player piano uh, where uh, everybody is basically unemployed because of machines again it's not a <laughs> it's, it's not it, it, it's 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 not a new idea and it's it's something that we as you know you know in our human societies need to tackle with caution <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more you know uh, for example if you go to the airport and you don't need to wait when a human being will print a ticket for you yes. because you can go to the machine and get this yeah. ticket you don't need to wait to waste your time so i think it's evolution and if some yeah. occupations will disappear that we can get time to time because of yeah. new uh, technologies that's uh, part of evolution it's better yes. to check out uh what kind of future can be for your occupation i think uh, taxi drivers will disappear one day because of ai that can yeah. drive ca our cars uh I m many other occupations that's that's okay you know and uh, it simplify our lives so yes no, I do think, uh, but one note though, I think we, we should ha be uh, cautious uh, and not over op optimist. Not well, there's individuals that are overly optimistic about which occupations <laughs> will uh, will disappear, and we have to be cautious about that. So, kind of uh, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, a great pioneer in AI, who's basically one of the you know one of the godfathers of deep, deep learning, in uh, uh, 2015. Uh, he said that radiologists will soon be out of a job uh, because uh, AI will just uh, read the, you know, the radiology uh, kind of uh, images and detect any diseases automatically. And in a way, what he said made sense to, to him because AI was doing a really great job of analyzing images. And he thought, well, radiology is just uh, imaging. It, it turns out it's not not that simple. There's a lot of nuance there. First of all, the images are a 3D, 3D and not 2D, and it's much harder to process 3D images. But more importantly, it turns out what a, radiology, a radiologist does isn't just look at an image and think back to history. Uh, they have to talk to the patient. They are like a detective, like parsing clues. There's some intu intuition and nuance involved. So now we're at a point where 
uh, the machine learning radiology models, they do okay when somebody's there to help them out, but they can't classify uh, diseases on their own. And more importantly, there's not enough new radiologists graduating medical school because a bunch of people were afraid that uh, the machines would take their job. So now there's a huge radiology uh, shortage and radiologists are really in demand. So one day, will one day, will uh, machine learning uh, take, uh, you know, automate radiology one day possibly but it's not today so <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice uh you know uh, i often get uh the meaning that you need to teach ai uh, for example uh if i need to teach someone uh, probably students my mm -hmm. customers anyone i i can uh, film a video course i can uh, create video content uh, write article how to teach AI? Uh, can you tell more about that? Because uh, mm -hmm. I understand that AI can come provide great results, okay. but yeah. if you teach, if you uh, lead in the right direction, you can get these results. Uh, yeah. Share more about that. Of course. So yeah. So again, I I kind of a uh, uh, wrote a uh, wrote a book introducing data science book camp, introducing some of the basics of uh, uh, AI and trying to teach it uh, to individuals who've. Uh, uh, never really fully explored these concepts before. And the way I like to teach after introducing the algorithms is to uh, show all the different ways in which the algor algorithms can break and be broken. I think it's it, it's kind of fairly fairly straightforward uh, with, you know to teach someone like if you start with the right the right baseline of math and programming, and communicate in a way where we take out all the technical jargon and really uh, communicate the intuition behind the algorithms. I think you you know using that careful careful communication, yes, we can teach what the algorithm is intended to do and how the algorithm uh, is supposed to work. Uh, the tricky part that comes with experience is is knowing a when to use the algorithm and b all the different ways that it can break and it can it can break in. Uh, Kind of in all sorts of ways, and again, that little nuance it's 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 commonly missing from how algorithms not only are taught but are uh, you know presented on pages like Wikipedia. Like for instance, one of the oldest uh, machine learning algorithms that's been around since the 1950s is the perceptron algorithm. Very simple algorithm, but it's it's basically the great granddaddy of all. Uh, artificial neural network techniques. And if you go on Wikipedia, you can see the perceptron algorithm and you can implement it yourself in like five lines of code using the three simple steps outlined on Wikipedia. Uh, what you might not know if you're new to the field is that the perceptron algorithm as outlined on Wikipedia is fundamentally incomplete. If you run it with a static learning rate, as you know, stated on the Wikipedia page, well, then it's not really going to converge and it's just going to oscillate back and forth and you're not going to know what you did wrong. And then when you go to, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, big name uh, universities, I'm not going to name any, but like universities that are known for teaching AI and machine learning, if you see their introductory slides to AI, they might have a single slide with a, about the perception algorithm and it's going to have that missing fundamental piece. And really, mm -hmm. the only way is somebody who who tries to communicate this uh, to you know uh, eager readers and eager learners. Uh, again, what what I try to do is uh, you know have uh, you know uh, have those individuals try out the algorithms first on uh, pr uh, problem sets where the algorithms work, and then on problem sets where the I know the algorithm is going to break, and then have them think about and discuss why that algorithm is going to break. And that's the only way to really to le really learn this point. Not only it, everybody talks about the limitless potential of this the, these techniques, and yes, they exist. But to be able to use them effectively, you have to first and foremost know their limitations. Mm -hmm. Well explained. Love it. Uh, okay, uh, let's talk about learning AI. AI. Uh, how uh, to learn today AI? For example, let's imagine you have no skills, uh, no skills, anything, no experience. Uh, what would you do if you start to learn AI today? Yeah, uh, I would say so. You you have to get your 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 hands dirty. It's like I don't know. It's like learning how to fix a car. It's not enough just to watch a YouTube video about it. So it won't necessarily uh, hurt. And the way it 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 the best way to learn, from my experience, is 
if you're inspired by a problem, so even if you're not familiar with AI and you're not necessarily familiar with coding, I mean, there's there's tools you can download to uh, to you use these uh, techniques, like the open AI techniques with minimal code. But first and foremost, find a problem you're passionate about that you believe can be addressed using uh, uh, tools that are publicly available. Do your research, uh, you know, make sure that the, the, the tools are the right tools. And again, this is where you can watch some, you know, YouTube videos, listen to a podcast, and then you have to roll up your sleeves, get your hand dirty and uh, try to use the tools to to play around with with the problem. And it's not, you know, you, you're, you're going to struggle at first. You're going to you kind of fail at first. But if you're, uh, again, if you're really passionate about seeing whether or not a solution is possible, that's that's the best way to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think uh, it's the same like uh, to read books. Uh, I don't know how, how to play tennis. If you yeah. uh, read a hundred books, how to play tennis yeah. and you don't play, <laughs> I'm not sure you can be good player, you know, uh, any any books, uh, how to play soccer, how yeah. to play chess, you yeah. need to play because for me acting is more important than any learning. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting that, uh, uh, by the way, I met a few times people who learn a lot and do mm -hmm. nothing. You know, uh, in some day, this uh, knowledge can be obsolete. Some of them uh, don't work for you. And uh, we have short memory. We can forget, you know, if you learn something and do nothing, you can forget about uh, getting skills. So for me, yeah, acting is more important than learning. So, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Okay, uh, can you tell me about uh, what kind of future uh, we uh, businesses can expect with AI? Do they need to jump today immediately, you know, uh, to think how to adapt AI technologies, or they can wait, you know, for some time when uh, AI will be much better, uh, better quality, and adapt in the future? What do you think? Uh, so I think. Uh... Uh, businesses must approach the, the problem with cautious optimism. They should dip their toes in the waters. At the same time, they should be should be careful. There's going to be a bunch of charlatans out there trying to you know sell them yeah. products uh, that aren't necessarily ready for the market or don't uh, necessarily uh, work. They should keep uh, uh, they should keep their eye out on what's possible. Uh, you experiment with tools again. A lot of bit. A lot of businesses are, are already using AI ubiquitously to a level where they don't realize it. Every time somebody, uh, you know, takes a customer's check and photographs it and it made immediately deposited in the bank, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, that that that's AI. They should keep uh, they should keep an eye out on what their uh, competitors uh, are doing. Uh, basically, the moment uh, uh, the, the moment a tool an algorithm begins to work. It it just like it it spreads like like wildfire. So uh, you know, for for instance, uh, you know, forty years ago, if a business saw uh, you know their competitors buying up uh, kind of like uh, you know personal computers, and the business was going, you know what, we'll just stick to uh, you know typewriters and uh, and and pencils. Well, <laughs> they're not going to be around <laughs> or uh, like uh, around for 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 long. Yeah. I, I, you know, automation is coming. Business has have to adapt. They are adapting. Uh, at the same time, it it's it 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 it's going to be a slow and gradual process. And there's going to be there there's going to be techniques that are just plain too early. The, the the other thing to watch out for, if let's say uh, you do have the misfortune of like a charlatan coming and trying to like sell you an algorithm that says like. It's going to completely revolutionize your business. And you try, you, you pay for the software, and the software doesn't work like it should. Uh, five, 10 years from the, down the line, it probably will. It was probably too early. The bugs weren't, uh, they, 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 mm -hmm. and the kinks weren't ironed out. But the, like, it doesn't mean you should not revisit this tool five years down the line. Uh, for instance, in like in like the the mid 1970s, a lot of uh, relational uh, database, uh, uh, you know, relational databases that you would purchase from an organization like Oracle, well, they don't work half the time. But that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that like you know, by the mid 80s, somebody offers to install a database in your business, you install a database. So the, even if you get burned in the past, be open uh, to these technologies in the future because they do improve over time.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, love it, love it. Leonard, it's a big pleasure, you know, to get all your uh, replies uh, to these questions. You know, uh, you share value, so much value, love it. Uh, tell our audience how they can reach out to you, learn more about you, follow you. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, you can, I'm uh, uh, Leonard Apelson. Uh, you can uh, follow me on LinkedIn or you can follow me at Ada Peltzen on, uh, on Twitter. Again, if you're interested uh, in more about uh, learning more about some of these uh, data science techniques, uh, please look up my book on uh, Data Science Bootcamp, Five Real World uh, uh, Python Projects, available uh, you know, via Matt Manning. And I'd be happy to uh, connect on LinkedIn or elsewhere. Okay, nice. You can uh, type this book uh, on private chat. I'll share with my audience. I'll add to this podcast episode. Okay, guys, you can find all these links uh, to LinkedIn, to website, uh, to this book in the description below. Listen to us on Apple, Google, Spotify. Uh, thanks again. You know, a big pleasure, Leonard. You know, I, I love learning about AI. I think it's my second passion, you know, after digital marketing, because Great. I think today mar- marketers can't be successful without considering AI yeah so because uh, yeah uh, it's hard to compete with others because they are using data they're creating content with AI I think yeah it's not the future it's today you know we need to do it today (laughs) great thank you so much Anatoly